uh, the, 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 the four of us, you, me, Gina, and Joe, uh, and maybe Oliver and Andre will communicate this way. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and that's it. Uh, one thing I saw here when I, I, I put full screen uh, with my presentation, I cannot see the the Go webinar like a panel. I mean, I'll be kind of blind. That's okay, Jose, because as soon as your screen is not swapped, so as soon as I move from your screen to the next presenters or just, just to the, the basic um, webinar viewer, um, you'll be able to minimize your presentation and see everything. So it's just while you present, you won't be able to see anything, but you won't need to see it anyway. Okay. Okay, we have 19. It's three past. Let's left. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's wait until 8:05, and then we're then we'll go. Okay. 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 Uh, the experience we had a month ago was that um, sort of between 8.05 and 8.10, lots of people showed up. So by the, time, by the time that I stop speaking, I think we'll be ready to go. And then, Joe, so maybe just to keep a lookout for Oliver, as soon as he um, arrives, that we make him an organizer, or at least a presenter. Sure. Thank you. No problem. And also, thank you for, for doing this on a public holiday. It's, it's oh. very much appreciated. No worries. Uh, sorry, David, just to check. So once I click start broadcast and we go live, um, will you say something first or shall I just start immediately? Uh, no, you can start immediately with your technical introduction. Great. And then, uh, and then, um, and then how hand will I know when you're done? How will you say? I'll just uh, say, and hand. I'll hand over to you. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I'm still... I see the box uh, that you want to show my screen. I'm just waiting uh, for now. Should I go ahead and share the screen now? Um, and then they, everybody will see. Nope. They'll still see the, the intro slide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, until we start the broadcast, they won't see anything yet. They'll, they're still in the waiting room. Until I share your screen, David, they won't, they won't see anything except the intro slide. Okay. Uh, it's 8.05. Shall we go? Yeah. Okay, so Joe, so you can go ahead and start recording. Yep. All right, I'm going to let everyone in now. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, to the Urbis webinar number two, How to Create and Support City and Regional Policy for Effective Nature-Based Solutions to Urban Sustainability, Resilience, and Livability. Just to give you some quick technical details for this webinar, um, all attendees will be in listen-only mode uh, during the webinar as it makes it easier for the presenters uh, to present. If you do have questions that you would like to raise during the webinar, either about the content or if you're having any technical difficulties, you do have a questions box in the GoToWebinar panel on the side of your screen. So please just send a message and someone can um, address it if it's a technical issue or the speakers will see that um, and can um, deal with those at the end of the presentation. Uh, that's all from my side, and David, um, take it away. Thank you. Welcome to the Urbis Dialogues. This is webinar number two. Today's webinar is curated by Jose Pupim. He is, and it is, how to create and support city and regional policy for effective nature-based solutions to urban sustainability, resilience, and livability. The webinar is brought to you by the Urban Biosphere Initiative, or URBIS. URBIS is a global network connecting uh, scientific researchers, foresighted policymakers, planners, environmental practitioners from across the world, partnering with local governments to share and develop and implement ideas for creating more resilient and equitable urban regions. Our advisory board and partners are shown on the screen right now. 
My name is David Maddox with The Nature of Cities. The Urbis Dialogues are a 15 webinar series, a global platform for urban dialogue led, uh, held uh, the first Thursday of every month and archived for repeated viewing on the ICLE Urbis website. It brings together representatives of cities, local governments, leading experts from around the world sharing experiences and addressing specific urban challenges focusing on sustainable use of regional biodiversity and ecosystem services to support social developments in a rapidly urbanizing world. Every month, the first Thursday in every month, please note that the next Urbis Dialogue, number three, will be held on the 2nd of July and curated by Chantal Van Ham of IUCN on reconciling economic development, investment attraction, and urban, urban green, identifying policies and incentives for livable cities. Today's website is curated by Jose, Jose Pubim de Oliveira, and its title is How to Create and Support City and Regional Policy for Effective Nature-Based Solutions to Urban Sustainability, Resilience, and Livability. Jose will begin speaking today, and we welcome any questions, so please use the questions feature on your control panel of your screen. Let's start by uh, introducing Jose. Jose Pupim is a Senior Research Fellow at the United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability in Tokyo, Japan. His research is multi- and interdisciplinary, involving applied social sciences and their links uh, with the natural resources and engineering. His academic expertise cuts across different fields, including planning, environmental policy, development studies, business, society, public administration, urban studies, and governance. Research, recent research and policy interests concentrate broadly in the area of political economy of sustainable development. Jose is particularly interested in patterns of governance, institution building, and policy in implementation at different levels, looking at how global institutions are interlinked to local governance and action, and vice versa. Please welcome. Jose. Okay. Uh, good morning, good night. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, we have here a uh, large number of people connected from all over the world, and I would like to thank uh, David Ubers for the invitation to share with you some experiences. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have uh, the dialogue uh, with the discussion how to create and support city and regional policy for effective nature-based solutions for urban sustainability resilience and livability. Uh, the idea is uh, in the end is try to understand uh, how cities they they move from uh, the way they do things now and do things that are, are much better in terms of uh, improving urban sustainability, resilience and livability. Uh, but before you actually go into uh, details of uh, how cities uh, move forward and the way they think and they, they do urban development, uh, I would share with you some information about cities related also to the last discussions uh, uh, last month, no, you had exactly because you have to justify why you need to do this, why you need to support the city and regional policy for effective nature based solutions. Uh, 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 as probably you have seen, you know, this kind of news, this is just from uh, uh, Nairobi, uh, like two, three weeks ago. Uh, cities expand. Calamity grow from bad to worse. It means a lot of cities are, are receiving the impacts of, of different phenomena, uh, but, uh, like climate change. But on the other hand, uh, you, you have also uh, this is from uh, my home country in Sao Paulo, where you have also uh, the, the the extremes. You have drought. People don't have water. At the same time, you have uh, flooding. Uh, and uh, people ask, uh, uh, always uh, blame the weather, you know, uh, the weather is crazy. And, 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 but on the other hand, when you look at and uh, you see in the screen uh, the, 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 the vegetal uh, cover of, uh, vegetation cover of, of Sao Paulo State, where, where the water to the city comes, uh, you have seen it has been degraded uh, uh, exponentially uh, as, uh, in the last 100 years. It means uh, you cannot 
uh, uh, continue with uh, what you are doing with you, our ecosystem. Uh, uh, if not, you're going to have the problems you have start seeing more and more often in many of the cities. Uh, as you discussed yesterday, uh, you have the local uh, problems, like I mentioned, the, the, the vegetation, but at the same time, they, they are linked directly with the discussions you had last month on the planetary boundaries. Uh, 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 and then uh, you've seen that uh, the planetary boundaries, uh, uh, we, we have to remind you, sorry, our speaker to click on accept the screen sharing. Hello? Uh, yeah, okay, continue, sorry for the, the, the technical leap, but uh, initially, as I said, the, the, these planetary boundaries, uh, they were, uh, uh, many of them, we already went over the limit. But at the same time, you would see the World Bank, uh, the number of people, particularly in the developing world, living under the po poverty line, has reduced drastically uh, 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 in the last uh, 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 20, 30 years, no? At the same time, uh, um, let me see here. You see, see exactly uh, the economic growth and uh, impact on, on poverty reduction in, in many countries, for example, in this case in Asia, uh, it being dramatic uh, improvements. I mean, on one side, you have the, the problems at a local level, uh, also at global level. But on the ha other hand, you also have seen benefits of this development, particularly related to, to urbanization, but it's still, you, you have uh, around 1 billion people living with uh, less than $1.25 a day, many of those in cities, uh, and around 2.2 .2 billion people, if you don't like this poverty line, living less than $2 a day. So you still need to provide a lot of uh, uh, jobs, incomes are going to see uh, to, to many of these uh, people that are coming to the cities, as well as to uh, those that are in rural areas, but the, the lives are more and more connected to the cities as, as the cities are, are, are being the, the main source of the economic development. Uh, 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 okay, uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 on the other hand, you have the, the, these discussions about equity, exactly because you have many of these people, mostly in developing countries that uh, you see in this graph, the human development index by the, the, the footprints on the vertical. And you see a lot of the countries that have very low footprints uh, are those that need to bring those uh, two billion people out of poverty. On the other hand, you have you seen the countries that actually achieve high levels of development, they have put much pressure uh, on the local and, and global environment. And the idea how we actually bring uh, all these people that has uh, overdeveloped, I would say, to the like the, the blue area. At the same time, all these people they are developing now, uh, particularly with urbanizations in, in Asia and Africa, they don't actually follow the same path. And this is why I think you need a, a, a different kind of urbanization and, and you're going to uh, justify this exactly because cities now just occupy a very small area. Uh, three, four, five percent different estimates, but they are large producers of, of impacts within and beyond the cities, but at the same time they, they can uh, provide many of the solutions. And, and the world, 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 urban world today, uh, we see uh, that, that more, as you know, more than 50 percent of population live in cities today, but in the last 20 years we have seen uh, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, moving to the cities, particularly in the continents that were not highly urbanized before. Just to have an idea, in Asia around uh, 750 million in, in the last 20 years, and another billion are coming uh, to the cities in Asia in the next 20 years. At the same time, Africa is just starting to urbanize rapidly. I mean, the 
the, the urbanization trends in the last decade is kind of unprecedented in, in, in history. We haven't seen this. At the same time, uh, you, you ask the question, is this sustainable? Are the approaches and tools, systems you have for cities that you use in the past and still use today adequate for uh, 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 all these urban development that is coming in the next decade? It means is you're looking and talking about uh, around 2 uh, billion people moving to the cities in the next uh, 20, 25 years. How exactly this is going to impact our local environment as our well global environment at the same time as the long-term development of all these people they are moving to the cities. And it's a different kind of urbanization, just put a few points. For example, you analyze uh, uh, you analyze the uh, uh, for example, cities in, in for example, uh, in Asia, a lot of those cities in China, for example, they are become much more like cities in the Western countries. Uh, uh, at the same time, you see the kind of development they have, like free cities in Africa, they are much more denser. But now with the urban development, you get more suburbanized with more sprawl, you know, occupying more land, at the same time increasing the emissions. Yet at the same time, you see, for example, particularly in the case of, of Africa, the data you have on cities, you have that cities actually are more unequal in terms of income and distribution of resources than actually the countries in Africa. They are already uh, high, has high inequality, but in South Africa, you get South Africa, Johannesburg. Jo South Africa is one of the most unique countries in the world, and jo Johannesburg is even more than South Africa. It means that as uh, continents are urbanizing, uh, because the, the cities are more unequal, uh, then the, the country, they are become, the countries as a whole uh, are, are becoming more unequal. And it means that this urbanization process raises a lot of questions uh, that you are not asking before because uh, uh, the kind of urbanization we have now is very, is very, very uh, uh, different. No? Uh, just move on. And it means the scale of the impact of uh, cities uh, both is, uh, can be uh, local. Uh, as you saw in the regional, but as well as as, as global, uh, and a lot of this, uh, what you see in the, the recent development of cities, is basically the cities they follow uh, uh, certain patterns as they increase their income. Uh, a lot of cities they tend to, uh, as you see, as they develop, some of the problems uh, actually improve. Uh, uh, the local sanitation, the change as they become richer, they tend to invest more in local sanitation. In terms of regional uh, air pollution, for example, or water, it t t tends to uh, uh, actually become a problem uh, in the beginning, but as they get rich, that actually improve uh, after certain income. But the global emissions end up being uh, an increase over time. And what we see in terms of the burdens, you move from local impacts to global impacts and from immediate uh, problems and you know, things that you have a health problem because you, uh, the water is contaminated to more delay problems like, for example, climate change where you undermine uh, the source of water and you have problems like you see in Sao Paulo now. Uh, see how to these uh, discussions in these, these why you need innovation, you need to actually link the problems that are global with the local solutions, exactly because what happened in the cities and with the urbanization respect in the next years, you're going to see a lot of challenges both at the local level because you need to still provide a lot of uh, 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 opportunities and a lot of service for the, the growing urban population, particularly in developing countries. At the same time, if this population follow the same pattern in the rich countries, we are going to uh, uh, have a lot of uh, 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 stress at global level that you could undermine a lot of the development in the long term. And the cities in emerging countries are particularly important, just quickly on that. If you see, I almost expect almost 90% of the, the emissions coming from uh, cities are coming from cities, the growth in cities, the growth in emissions are coming from cities in, in, in developing countries, no? And when you talk about cities, it's not only the big mega cities, more than 10 million, that the, those are around just 5%, 5, 6% 5, of the total urban population, but particular cities in the middle that where 
uh, you don't have much information or you don't know exactly how to uh, address those problems at, at this scale. You know, cities with around 1 million, 100,000, and there are hundreds uh, 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 of those cities uh, uh, around the world. Just to give you an idea now, is, uh, I was reading that like China is around 200 cities with around 1 million or more, and many of those, you probably many of us have never heard the name. At the same time, you have the major economies now, it's almost 50% of the economy of the world, and they also have a lot of research uh, capacity economy. It means the, the solution for the problems uh, you talk about uh, in terms of long-term development pass through cities and close those cities, in, uh, particularly those cities, I would say, in the emerging economy in the future because they follow the same path you're going to have problems. How to actually solve those problems? And then we'll start now moving to more directly to uh, uh, how cities innovate. Because what you have now is uh, uh, this new wave of innovation is the only way you, you, you can actually uh, solve some of the problems you, you have today and avoid future problems. It's how to do things different from what uh, we've been doing in the last uh, uh, 100 years in terms of urbanization. And you see there are huge opportunities. You see growth in many of the, the, the waste management and green commodities, but at the same time, uh, you see the large investment in infrastructure around this year will be around a uh, uh, study we did with UNDP around uh, $10 trillion uh, uh, of investment uh, in infrastructure, uh, more or less around 70% of these in cities, uh, around $7 trillion per year. And how we actually shift these urban uh, investments in infrastructure in different kinds of, of, of investment. And when you talk about learning, now, how actually uh, uh, support and, and, and start using these native-based solutions, because you'll see many examples. I'm going to show you some of these examples as you, you move ahead in the discussions. But at the same time, you, you, you have uh, things that you need to do that doesn't exist today. As I said, the, the, how the organization is moving now, you have uh, actually learned by doing. A lot of things actually you have today in the cities, they are, they are uh, in, the, in the frontier of, uh, for example, using nature-based solution, they actually were the first to they learn by doing. And new things you need to learn, uh, and then a lot of these will be learned by doing. But also, you can learn by interacting, learning from other cities. You're going to have, hopefully, a discussion on that later on uh, uh, with the, the other speakers. And also uh, learning by using, you know, as you use a new tool and uh, uh, you start doing things differently, uh, and then you also learn in this process. And this is a little bit what you, you plan to discuss now. So the importance, and then the importance to do things different, uh, to innovate now, exactly because you cannot follow the path you're following now because of the problems we discussed. At the same time, how actually change, you, you need to innovate and to innovate uh, uh, you need to uh, uh, learn how to do things uh, 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 differently. And, and when you talk about uh, 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 how we move then a little bit more in the, the planning area, the understanding the uh, people-nature relations through uh, cities, you have a different approach to, to, to urban sustainability that uh, has uh, uh, evolved over time. You have uh, uh, different uh, discussions uh, since the 1940s, 50s, when you talked about the, the resilient, safe health city because of the pollution, to now to discussions of more more equitable, livable, sustainable cities. Now, in a lot of these discussions, uh, uh, they 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 a lot of these discussions they actually. Uh, has these uh, different impacts and different ways to think the, how to do this in cities. And there are some conversions and some notion in policy making, but also some diversions as you're going to discuss uh, just uh, discuss now. For example, uh, for example, intensive use of urban uh, land networks uh, or green corridors, this, for example, can improve livability. You have more green space close to your house. At the same time, it can increase sustainability. 
because you're going to have a, a less heat, uh, heat wave impact, but also uh, even carbon capture, as you're going to see. But at the same time, when you talk about different things in, uh, about, for example, density, density is, is very different when you think of, for example, a lot of discussing sustainability, you talk about, you know, densify the city exactly because uh, uh, you have uh, 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 less cost with the urban infrastructure at the same time with transportation, it's easy to put people move around. But at the same time, lavability, some discussion is too dense. Uh, you, the lavability is going to be decreased because you, you have more people in the same place and then you have less space for people, at the same time more chance to, to infect those disease, move around the city, and then is how we actually make these different notions uh, uh, compatible. And then you have evolved where you think cities uh, when you discuss and measure the space performance. Uh, because the city is not physical, what you see maybe is the physical, the cover, the buildings, the parks, but actually uh, when you look at the other parts of the cities, and this is what, what I have to stress here, because exactly the physical part, uh, when you, particularly ones human-made, they, they have some links with the function part, you know, that you have some function for commercial residential to people to leave a building or a park to people to have entertainment, but also have more symbolic, uh, uh, you know, identity, ownership, sense of belonging, sense of a community that also are linked to the physical space. I mean, when you talk about city and, and the physical space, you have these different uh, 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 ways of looking at it. At the same time, when you talk about cities, uh, 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 sustainability, livability, resilience, you're also talking about different issues, both for sectoral issues, uh, energy, transportation, how to provide this in a sustainable way, and also to make the city more resilient. You know, like here in Tokyo, where I'm based, with the earthquake, had a lot of problems with energy because they depend a lot of these nuclear reactors and many of them shut down. The city was without energy, but how actually make it more resilient in, in, in this aspect, okay? Uh, and also, it, but as you move down, this scale is getting more and more complex. You don't want to talk sectoral issue, but uh, you move to fiscal issue, buildings, land use, regional issue, a lot of the economy of the city affect other parts of the, the region. Uh, up to the, the issues related to green agenda issues like consumption and things that affect, uh, as I mentioned, discussed before globally, you know, like how a lot of the deforestation in the Amazon or Borneo is not because of the people are there or the cities are there, but a lot of demands coming from uh, 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 different parts, you know. And then also you, you, you talk about these issues, resilience, sustainability, uh, 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 livability, you also have uh, uh, we have a researcher doing work on uh, on this here, the different scales, and then you can interpret differently, uh, a seed scale, neighborhood scale, and, and, and I would call a uh, uh, street low level, small scale, street indicators to uh, analyze these different topics. And then it's very different when you talk sustainability at seed scale. Uh, for example, we say, oh, we're very high density and good for, for transportation, but when you talk about street scale, maybe something different, uh, because you have too much dense and you don't have much uh, uh, green areas. You don't have also a uh, buffer for the flooding when you have the rain, and then how actually uh, move, move in this, uh, this, this analyzing these three scales. Uh, Okay, just moving in the conceptualization, the, the way you think about cities uh, uh, and how to connect uh, the different concepts. Uh, you start with the ideas, the, the main idea, for example, idea of urban planning, they start in the, the 100 years, a little more, bit more in the past with the garden cities was the idea of the cities are too congested, too polluted, you have to uh, uh, move people away from certain activities uh, up to the discussions we have today they actually a lot of the discussions have a hundred years ago like moving uh, uh, functions of the city in different parts of the city maybe today because the cities uh, you have today and the technology you have today allow us to have a lot of these functions together and then a lot of people talk about uh, this mixes use and how this uh, m move like uh, this learning uh, uh, for example, just give you an example, adapting building codes. Most of the cities around the world, they have a 
one informal or formal building codes. Anyway, start introducing some of those uh, issues you just discussed that could have win-win situations uh, uh, to, the, for example, the building codes, the plant strip, uh, the, the tree spacing, design details, type of the vegetation, and so on. This is something that uh, you are, are, are seeing that uh, cities are learning from each other. You know, uh, you just see the bicycle, a space for bicycle. For example, uh, these or, or the corridors, I've seen a lot of cities adapt from other cities around the world and start using, uh, uh, doing this thing differently, learning by doing or learning by interacting with other cities. Same thing, interpretation design projects, you know, design how you interpret, you see the trees here, but you know what kind of tree, Maybe this is important. Well, the function of the tree, if you think more detail, and you, you, you can also go up to this uh, uh, scale if you need. But the important thing, particularly when we talk this new wave of organizations, to talk about uh, uh, co benefits. And then this is link the climate change uh, uh, and development and biodiversity with the idea today when you talk about, okay, you have you need to have urbanization. In the past, like 100 years ago, it's just national local development needs, like uh, industrial revolution is kind of just industrialized and people just move into the city chaotically. You have all the problems that in the water, in the air, and then you start now thinking the 100 years ago how to move these two things together. But now uh, also we have the global environmental goals, how to actually include all this together. And when you talk about this, it's not actually uh, rocket science. It's more issues related to, uh, for example, greening with local species, for example, to avoid invasive species is the kind of tree I just mentioned to you in the previous slide. For example, preservation for wetlands to have the functions, for example, to uh, buffer uh, uh, extreme events. For example, you can achieve these three goals. I mean, you're not talk about very high tech uh, solutions that you can use the nature that's already there and try to uh, uh, use the best in, the, in terms of the functions, no? And then you, you can think how to do that in different processes of the city. This is already studied. The cities, the, the, the economic social pro process, uh, 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 you, you see the transformation space, that's maybe the thing that affects most the, uh, the change of the landscape, but at the same time you have uh, production and consumption in cities that impact how uh, cities, for example, a lot of cities today, they produce things to export and consume it for up to the, the circulation transport. But at the same time, the part that you don't think much in cities and you're thinking more in the last years is exactly uh, 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 the ecosystem services and, and social service. You're still thinking more about this, the relation of the cities, urbanization with this, as well as what called the knowledge economy, the human, social, intellectual capital that are generated in the city. Uh, it means that uh, if you remember the previous slide, uh, the, the, the previous three is basically the the physical part mostly, but uh, and the bottom is more about the order, the symbolic, and also the function part that's all, uh, important for the, the, the bottom two items here. No? And a bit just economics to uh, uh, finalize and give you some example. You can think, okay, uh, you have problems that you see in the cities and it causes externalities, no pollution. Uh, you can have costs uh, uh, of reducing now much cheaper than the proscatting. Pro this you know, not always report, it's then review and others say, okay, you, you, you tackle biodiversity, climate change, a lot of urban problems we have today is much cheaper than the future. The same for urban infrastructure. If you build a good network of public transportation as a city is growing, as the Cato Curitiba, you're going to see, is much cheaper than you start doing this after you, 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 you do. Why these changes are not happening? If you make economic sense, why not happen? One is kind of information. People really don't know or don't know how, uh, how to do. The other is, is they know, but they don't have the resources. It, uh, so it makes sense financially, they know, economically they know, but they don't have the invest risk to, to invest now to have benefits in the long term, and maybe finance can help. But a lot of issues are related, I would say, to political economy. 
a lot of this change uh, may have aggregate benefits for the whole population of the city, but certain groups may be against uh, or are going to lose of this change and they have to somehow uh, uh, change the way they do things. And then also, uh, also a lot of these complex, complex of inter internalized externalities uh, 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 and then you are now develop some ways to how you actually internalize these issues related to, for example, the carbon market, CDM, or now the red for forest uh, interest examples of how to do that. And how align these uh, goals is, is you can do information, uh, spread information is why, why a lot of uh, Oliver a little bit we're going to talk about to you about the sharing of information, the creation of the network and learning, issues related to finance, you know, create proper mechanisms for cities uh, around the world uh, to actually uh, uh, invest in a lot of issues they see that's important but they don't have the risk At the same time, uh, is a problem if the city don't have what say innovation capability, they don't have the capability to use well the financial resources, they may actually wasting a lot of resources. How we actually think about the capability of the cities in order to where you have the information, you have the resources, you have the political will, you actually can do the things in the right way. And this is one issue that you're trying to, to, to understand better, how to uh, uh, improve and move forward the innovation capability of the cities to uh, uh, use best the, the resources they have. In the urban planning, there is a, a, a very a, a large opportunity now because you are moving uh, the, 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 the understanding of urban planning in the past, 100 years ago, as I mentioned to you, was the idea that actually uh, biodiversity, for example, there was no place in the city, maybe in the zoo or in the botanical garden. But now, on the other hand, the, the conservationists, they would think the city should be like a national park. You have moved people out. You have all these blocks of uh, 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 parks in the city. But now, no, you, you can't uh, uh, move to the, the, the idea of uh, 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 integrate these two parts. I mean, now we think much more conservation, also with people. Uh, involved and then the cities is uh, uh, when you talk about cities you talk about people but at the same time when you have uh, the urban planning now people see actually planning uh, cities are not a place for buildings also can be placed for biodiversity for green areas for agriculture and how to make all these use compatible and, and move in this direction well I, I, I have a few other uh, points I would like to make uh, to mention uh, but uh, I will now have uh, to pass the word to uh, my colleague uh, uh, Oliver Hillo. Uh, maybe some of you know Oliver, uh, and, and Oliver has been a program officer at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity uh, in Montreal, Canada for the last 80 years. Uh, he is responsible for stakeholder engagement, including on issues of national implementation, involvement of states, regions, and cities, as well as sustainable tourism, soft-soft cooperation, island biodiversity. He is a biologist with a master's degree in environmental education, MBA on managerial accounting and hotel management. Oliver has over 25 years of experience of international cooperation, negotiation, of sustainable tourist event organization, and, and training and capacity building program across many teams, themes, and issues related to sustainable development. Oliver, uh, uh, now the, the, the floor, the voice, no, is yours. Thank you, Jose. Can, can everyone hear me? Uh, is there any way maybe for the... Um, I don't know if you can reply to me whether this works, whether you can hear me well. Good. Excellent. Very good. So thank you, Jose. This is wonderful. And thank you very much for this opportunity to be uh, contributing to this webinar. I, I feel very honored to be in one of the first Urbis webinars. I, congratulate uh, David and Georgina and the people who are, have really helped to create this opportunity. So I'll try to be brief. Uh, my contribution here is more like um, a mixture of institutional and personal 
uh, uh, report on the history of the uh, involvement of uh, local and subnational authorities in the work of the convention and in this, of course, trying to contribute to the discussion to how can we create uh, policies for cities and for landscape level at, at state and province level for uh, cities that actually, uh, you know, use uh, nature as an asset for quality of life uh, for citizens. So uh, quick Quickly, I, I wanted to uh, tell you what we've learned, and this is a mixture of this, the, the, the convention as the, the secretariat and, and this team of people who have been working on trying to bring, including Jose and Andre, trying to bring uh, the issues at, at city level, at the urban level, into the discussions of the convention, which, as you probably know, is a much larger body of national governments and UN agencies. So basically there is this strategy on biodiversity and the question is we want to stop, reverse the, the rate of loss of biodiversity at the global level and how can that be changed? And of course as we've been discussing uh, really the response to most of the uh, stakeholder coordination issues is really at the local level. So this is the first uh, slide here. Um, this is also what I've been hearing from uh, ECLAY meetings and from the meetings and the summits in the convention uh, at the conference of the parties over the last uh, eight years is that mayors really are beginning to note that uh, biodiversity as a political concept and as a campaign uh, focus has some uh, advantages in the sense of addressing a lot of the very important issues for people such as water and food health uh, provides a lot of jobs and it is a very important issue um, as you all know so I'm not going to go into the scientific basis of the sixth global extinction but the point is we know very well why it's happening uh, what happens also in my experience is that the convention was a quite profitable place or productive place for this discussion between mayors and cities and national governments to take place around biodiversity because it's a pretty it's got a pretty wide mandate and an almost universal ratification and uh, it is the first multilateral environmental agreement to have a specific plan of action addressing the interactions between national subnational government cities and other local authorities so it's, it, it provides a very wide mandate and there's been very um, productive summits thanks also to the very good partnership with ECLE over the last uh, four COPs, in fact five uh, coming back to 2008 as we will briefly come over in a few seconds. So uh, for 2016 we have a conference of the parties in Mexico and there also will be a summit there with a proposed larger role for states and provinces for the very simple reason that Mexico has actually done some noteworthy progress in mobilizing state uh, the provinces in their cases uh, on biodiversity strategies and action plans. So um, I'm not telling anyone uh, anything new and, and pointing out that it's uh, there is a big need in the convention and for biodiversity to mobilize the local level particularly in um, mega diverse emerging countries and here there's a few there's a, a, some data here that shows that over the next uh, uh, 30 years or, or uh, so, we will have uh, 300 million people just in China alone moving from the rural area into the urban area and that means that we need to build all the technologies and this is also in those cities and, and the biggest growth factor is in cities up to 1 million inhabitants in many of those regions including India and Africa. Uh, the fact is that those are the ones that are building the solutions as well to decouple uh, consumption of natural resources and quality of urban life because that's where this is an issue. So that's uh, noteworthy to see that those are the places where we need to identify those solutions and bring them into the discussion of national governments because uh, here this slide shows uh, what we've learned are critical mandates for urban governments, for urban governance systems, not only official public uh, authorities but also city-based 
non-governmental networks, uh, citizens and people's organizations and, and all kinds of community organizations. But uh, the, the points in this slide, um, they are most importantly the mandate of local authorities. Uh, nobody else can communicate with citizens with the same efficiency. Nobody else can, incent, uh, can create incentives for consumption and production patterns that are uh, much less in, impacting on biodiversity and uh, they wield significant power in public procurement, uh, protection of watersheds, etc., etc. So there you can see that uh, if the convention, if national governments want to achieve progress on those issues, they will have to work with the urban authorities and networks and this is what we've learned. Um, I will talk about this. This is the Cities and Biodiversity Outlook, but this is a publication that brings 10 key messages of a really wide-ranging publication that we uh, produced in a cooperative network with uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center with UN and UIAS and with uh, ECLEI, uh, financed by a network of institutions including UN Habitat, and this publication brought to light some of the issues that need to be discussed when we talk about cities and biodiversity. Um, I, I will, I'm, I'm quickly going through those slides because I'd, I'd like to take a little bit more time later on to discuss the experience that we had, but we had a very productive cooperation with ECLE as a network of cities, particularly those leaders in uh, the Local Action for Biodiversity project, which has been and, and remains still, in my view, the gold standard for biodiversity action for cities. But uh, the Urbis uh, dialogues, the cities in hotspots project, the regional networks that we've been able to work with, uh, the one called Metaversities, led by the city of Montpellier for cities around the Mediterranean, and uh, the Maritime Innovative Territories International Network, led by the uh, Brest Metropole Océan conglomerate of cities, which uh, is a movement of port cities. So um, we've been learning those things. We've been learning that we need a francophone and a lusophone network because language is also culture and culture is also solution and technology. You can't just transfer technology. You have to adjust it to every different culture. So. Uh, Again, I, I want to spend a little time just explaining to you the points that I think are important to make from this experience. The first uh, is that, you know, we have to build capacities all around. It's not an easy, uh, it was not an easy experience because those levels of governance are not used, strange as it seems, to cooperating on issues, be it biodiversity or many others. So, in fact, the experience that we have is quite unique and unfortunately we haven't seen that level of cooperation in many of the other multilateral environmental agreements. Um, so, you know, the, the, the point was that we need to find uh, leaders here and we have to uh, find the, the, the fine art of uh, identifying uh, issues that resonate at the different levels between mayors uh, and then we have to think of small scale mayors, larger scale mayors, in big cities, they are really governors, and then we have governors of large provinces, and we even have governments of semi-autonomous regions and islands. Uh, let's think of those of the European Union or of, of the United States or other islands that, that uh, need to be involved at the subnational level as well. And, and when we come to mainstreaming, that's when the point comes. Um, I uh, have, uh, this is my last slide, I want to say that in this experience we had to keep the door open for new initiatives, that was always um, a point for us, Not, never to close the door for new engagement because institutions come and go and stakeholders kind of resonate their contribution through different doors, political doors. But uh, as I said, very important to take that experience to the other conventions I think uh, we see today very interesting, if we have a million mayors in the world, this is also a very complex world and there's not just the poor and the developed nature, the nations, there is today a whole range, depending on how you look at it, of uh, independent and complementary experiences. So the idea is really we have to build the capacity in uh, developing countries uh, to uh, contribute uh, to this discussion. 
And, and then I just want to remind that we as UN, we have to figure out better ways to uh, contribute. Um, I, you know, there's this Habitat 3 process in UN Habitat now, and we would like to see UN Habitat grow to become the keeper of the message of this urban agenda. Uh, the CBD and ECLE have contributed, I hope many others have as well, but there will be further opportunities. And we have to learn how to set up those multi-stakeholder projects through practice. So if, uh, I think the, the, the last message here is let's learn by doing. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm sorry if uh, the time run a little bit over. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Oliver, for uh, 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 the presentation. I think it is a wonderful effort that uh, you you started as, as a secretary of the convention. And I think it's an innovation international level exactly because it's the first uh, international process that actually incorporating uh, uh, different levels of, of the government beyond uh, what we call the central government to have a dialogue with the, the cities. It has been very important to create a, a partnership with a lot of sharing of experience as well as, as learning involved. I just, uh, uh, before you uh, move to the questions and then I'll, I'll just please send your questions through uh, the panel. There is a panel, there is a, a, a question uh, uh, window, you click there and put your questions and they'll start uh, 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 moving uh, you to the questions. But why we're not in the questions yet, I'm going to, uh, uh, to actually show you uh, a few examples uh, 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 that cities around the world have actually uh, innovated and just give you for example, now, uh, let me see uh, how to do this, uh, sorry. Uh, here we have, for example, the city of Curitiba. Just give three quick examples as you move to, to the questions. Uh, the city of Curitiba in Brazil has been, one city has been uh, innovating in many areas, in the area of biodiversity and green areas, once one of those cities. For example, there has been cooperating uh, uh, first in the law, a lot of the international discussions uh, on, on biodiversity and sustainability. At the same time, for example, uh, give incentive to landowners to preserve uh, 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 some of the uh, land from uh, uh, urban development, uh, as well as the, the state itself has given incentives to the cities in terms of tax transfers. Uh, in order to uh, help the cities that, for example, has reservoir of water for a region that the city could get more transfers from the state taxes and with these uh, uh, payment for the ecosystem service. At the same time, you have uh, other uh, examples. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, global impacts, how to reduce your global impacts, one approach is the fair trade. Uh, you have seen a network of fair trade uh, 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 cities around uh, the world. i just give you an example. This gas tank, UK, is at, at least they say this is the first uh, uh, full fair trade city that 100% of the shops there uh, uh, are linked to the fair trade network. Where they know exactly from where the products are coming and so they can uh, 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 mitigate some of the impacts of the consumption in the cities. Up to example, a Tequini municipality in Durban, uh, this is South Africa, different continents, where also you have seen important movements there. The problem is exactly unemployment, particularly young youth people. Uh, they don't have jobs, and the one idea is how to create green jobs with a, a lot of issues related to uh, improving green areas that can help, for example, uh, uh, just to give you an example uh, of one of the projects, uh, this uh, Buffest Dry Landfill Site Community Reforestation Project, uh, where it was a, a, a landfill site where they, they, they close and they, they account up using uh, a lot of the local labor people who need a job to actually help in the reforestation efforts. That means there are a lot of opportunities that you link these with the needs of the cities and the things you link back to the discussion we had before. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, how to link global issues that maybe for the city 
is very difficult to, to understand and move forward the agenda to the local issues like this that you just showed with so And just to finalize uh, on how cities innovate and move to the questions, uh, what you see in our uh, work here, you see there is a lot of uh, opportunities, technological opportunities, like uh, uh, let's say benefits of social, uh, solve local social environmental problems, as well as uh, uh, solutions to global environmental problems. It was called technical feasibility. And then with R&D research, you can actually supply side, you can move this to uh, uh, have a larger uh, 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 intercession between these two, you have more solutions and solutions that tackle both problems. But when you think about economic political viability, much less what is feasible in general, much less than what is technically uh, feasible, what is economic, political, and social viability affect how this is transferred to practice. At the same time, uh, the core benefit is the idea that actually we have the institutional development that. And move forward the feasibility uh, uh, um, to, to uh, promote uh, by public policy, market driven, and then you make the technical solution, the things you develop that you learn to the practice at a much larger scale and as well as to place outside from where it was initially developed. No? And then it is it really, I think, the issues about learning about innovating, do things differently. We have the supply side, you, go, you can do things in, in planning, urban planning school, in ecological planning uh, 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 research, in practice, to develop idea, but you need to have the demand side, who actually is going to use that. The city needs to have uh, uh, the, the, the demand for uh, uh, the desire to use these things somehow. And then what you yeah, discussed before about the, the obstacles you have in terms of the political economy. And at the same time, the issue about learning uh, we just discussed before. And these three are uh, directly connected. And just to finalize and move to the questions, uh, uh, as because of the time, you just brought it on innovation, how cities learn, and actually you have to think and uh, this beyond the firms. I think firms are important uh, to develop technologies like IT and others, but the use uh, and the innovation that you need to see is a little bit different and go beyond this technological innovation. At the same time, this is place-based. Uh, I know it depends not only the economics, but the, how, how the culture uh, 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 develop these ideas to, to adapt to the local needs. And also the idea that, that, that you need more interaction among organizations. Uh, it means when you think a solution for urban problems is not only the city government, but the, the, the broad space of, uh, of uh, uh, stakeholders involved. And it is the public, public laws can nurture a lot of these development I have seen, but also can hurt. Uh, now I'm going to, to pass the, to uh, 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 David Mandox for uh, the questions. Uh, and the discussions. Thank you, Jose. Uh, we'd like to transition to the question and answer period here, the discussion period. If you have a question, please type it into the questions box. I'd like to start with a question to Oliver. Uh, and that is, Oliver, you mentioned the idea of finding leaders, and you also mentioned the idea of uh, gathering more cities to this movement. We have lots of ideas uh, about how to, how to do nature-based solutions better in various cities, but there's still a relatively limited number of cities that have access to this kind of information and, and, uh, and momentum. How do we find these leaders? How do we gather more cities to these kind of ideas? Uh, yeah, well, thanks, uh, David, and thanks to whoever made that question because it's a very good one. I've been fi trying to figure this out, and um, I saw in the in the organizers' exchanges that everyone was trying to figure. Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> it's uh, not easy. I think first, um, in my experience, there is uh, at least uh, four levels. The first, I think, is cost. Um, for many of developing cities, I can assure you, they want to come on board. When they hear about this, they their uh, people in the nature or environment or even sometimes mayor themselves have expressed to me the wish to get engaged. But the fact is municipal budgets in the developing world are not there 
to start that kind of engagement at the international level, exchanges, learning, getting into networks, getting learning how to use biodiversity at the local level, which is also a question, I mean, it's a combination of technique and political savvy, if you want. So you need uh, the cost issue, which we are trying to overcome by uh, contacting donors to enable cities to join those many networks that I mentioned. Second problem is institutional. Not many cities have somebody who is responsible for uh, biodiversity. Normally people at city level, when they talk about environment, they mean waste management, and we know that. So sometimes you have a parks department, uh, uh, which is very green and maybe too green for uh, being able to address the whole range of CBD issues. So sometimes it's an institutional problem, but I would say not so much because, in my experience, mayors themselves see the great advantage of getting engaged on biodiversity. That's the other point. We need leaders. It's uh, not easy. Out of uh, you know many, many people involved in decision-making, not all of them have all the conditions required to overcome the barriers to make their cities join and work and initiate work on biodiversity. It takes vision, but it's there. And sometimes this is almost like a personal career development support to mayors or to decision makers in cities and to all other levels of governments as well. Sometimes it's just that person who is thinking, would I take this challenge or not? And you're there to tell them, yes, and this is why. And then they say, well, yeah, why not? The last point I think is that in in fact, there are many cities involved already. There's an amazing amount of initiatives all over the world with different names, and José was pointing to some. But, I mean, there's an enormous amount of movements in any of the UN agencies. What we need is umbrella institutions or networks or platforms through which they can see the value of cooperating at the global level. And this is when they will become also more visible, all those different initiatives. So I think my my response uh, would stay uh, at that level for now. Thank you. Hello. Can I add something? Uh, uh, also, in what Oliver said, I think it's very important when you say do things that not only you need a lot of money or, or high tech, you can do a lot of things, particularly nature-based solutions. Uh, I'll just show you some examples that uh, uh, the cost is not that, that much. Uh, uh, and something basic, and then I didn't have time to talk to you, but you, you, you have a, uh, I have the discussions on the degree of capabilities. You have different levels of capability. You have very advanced cities that are doing things that are new to the world, uh, but also have cities that are very basic, new to the cities, things they have not done to the city, very basic things they can do with very low budget. At the same time, you have the, those intermediary, like new to the country. They just start in doing something because they learn elsewhere. And also the importance of uh, uh, sharing this experience locally uh, and, and having your city uh, if you're doing something new, for example, for your country, how to share these with the cities around, to your own state, sometimes province, because these were the cities generally more similar. They have the same, uh, sometimes the same uh, regulatory framework of the state of the country. It's much easier to transfer uh, uh, those initiatives. And I mean, when you think about uh, leadership, you think about uh, doing things different, you actually don't need a, a lot of resource. Resource help. Uh, but the case of Curitiba itself is a very innovative city, but it's not a particular rich city. When it started doing things in 1970s, it's basically the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 start doing things because uh, had someone who started thinking, let's do things that are simple, with a simple technology that you can afford, you can sustain the long term. Here's another uh, question from the, from the floor a follow-up to the questions that we've just been discussing now. How can local governments best measure and share their successes both to their citizens and to the higher levels of government? How, how can we create more momentum by communicating the successes of nature-based solutions internally to cities and regionally? Okay. Uh, Oliver? 
Hello? Okay, I, I, I will start. Uh, yes. Uh, and then Oliver is going to uh, also add more because he has more in, experience also in these uh, uh, transfer at different levels. But what I've seen, uh, i just give you an example. Uh, in my own country, Brazil, uh, a very practical example. I just mentioned Curitiba in the state what Curitiba is Paraná. There is this uh, value-added tax transfer based on ecological uh, 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 performance uh, of the city, of the municipality. And this is started in Paraná and through a network of states in Brazil. Now uh, around uh, uh, more than uh, 12 states in Brazil, they have similar uh, kind of uh, initiatives and the states they innovate when they adopted these for example in other states Curitiba is just uh, uh, more uh, green and water but other states include waste management for example uh, uh, in the in the performance and, and then get, exactly because give incentives to cities that recycle they have a good, good waste management practice also benefit from this strength as, a, as an incentive it is very important to think uh, 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 this tr transfer not only international level, I think it's important to bring these lessons, particularly in terms of sometimes capacity, but also think what can do in your own network, your own country, or your own metropolitan region. Oliver, for you. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, I, I was going to add, I think um, it, the, que the, the answer to this question, how to measure, I think has two dimensions. One is more technical. And I think we've had a very relevant experience in this with the use of the uh, Singapore Index on Cities Biodiversity or the Cities Biodiversity Index, which was an initiative started by the city-state of Singapore at the time and which uh, really put a lot of effort and uh, scientific and design uh, creative imagination into designing a system to measure uh, the contribution to biodiversity from every city's um, governor. So it talks about biodiversity, it talks about biodiversity services, and it talks about the governance of biodiversity itself. It's a set of 23 indicators, and the experience of testing this is in 100 cities is very relevant to the technical aspect of that. Now, that what, what I also wanted to say is I think the answer is more political. When you want to measure, you want to report. So what you want to measure needs to be relevant to the people you're reporting to. And in the case of cities in most of the world, the uh, reaction of citizens themselves is essential. So we need to make sense when we say measure. We need to make sense to what is relevant to the, the, to the ultimate citizen. So we need to imagine when we say what is, does it mean to measure biodiversity? Well, it can mean birds because people do like to look at birds, but maybe it doesn't mean a mathematical number of species versus frequency of individuals or populations. It may mean health. It may mean how close are you to a park in a certain city. It may mean, uh, yes, green cover, but not necessarily just uh, very biodiverse parks where the the people can't get in, but maybe a lot of mixed parks where people can actually enjoy a weekend and, and lay on the on the green grass. And it may mean Ruel uh, Vert, this initiative where people plant things in their backyard. So there are many levels that I think we can measure uh, how uh, biodiversity is relevant. But the, the political point is it's a process like Local Agenda 21. You need to involve everyone and then come to a governance moment where you can actually report on indicators. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hey, we have thank a, you, Oliver. Uh, Let's, uh, we have time for one, time for one more question. Um, and it's from uh, Julie Goodenough, and it's a follow-up to, to this question of, of integration, both vertical integration and horizontal integration. How do we attract more uh, young people into these fields? How do we get more training in urban, urban uh, planning that is ecologically sophisticated and ecologically sensitive? And I uh, ask that question from, from the perspective from around the world. So how do we get more people in South America and Africa and Asia and Europe, all of these, all of these regions, more into, into urban planning? Uh, Oliver and Jose. Okay, uh, uh, just some uh, 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 thoughts, uh, and also the work we're doing here. 
uh, also looking at the practitioners. We have done a, a few researchers on, on the practitioners. Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, this is, I think, the biggest problem because uh, people who are on the field in the professions, once they move out from school, uh, it's very difficult to actually change the way they were trained because uh, the professionals, uh, a lot of time, they, they, they have some background, they start working, they don't change. And just to give you an example, in urban planning, uh, when I did my studies in 1990s, uh, nothing on biodiversity, not even mentioned uh, and biodiversity, if you mention people say not space in the city, city is space for people, you know, biodiversity, elephants, uh, uh, mosquitoes, these, they don't have space uh, in the city. But today, it's start, little by little, even though it's lowly, you get in these to the, 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 the planning schools, um, architecture schools, and then the students that are coming out, they actually are, are a hope of innovation because they are coming with new ideas. And also, the generations are changed. My generation is different from the generation that people are now in university. And our hope is that uh, these young people we going to get more engaged. You see exactly this. A lot of people involved, the, for example, seen the webinars. Uh, uh, some students, people who are just start working in the cities, and they are very keen to learn, do things different. But a lot of times, when they get there. There are some barriers because they try to do something different that is not actually accepted by the, the way they are doing, but also sometimes the political economy. There's some interests that are not uh, uh, interested in getting uh, uh, things done different. And it's very difficult to, and then we have to work always with different stakeholders to actually get if things don't uh, 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 change over time. You know, Oliver, you want to mention something? Yeah, thanks. I think I wanted to, uh, a more general um, response to that would be a question of translation. I think we start, uh, we, the people who work on nature need to start speaking the language of urban planners and, and vice versa. We have to talk to infrastructure planners. This is the biggest budget item that links local and national authorities and international donors is infrastructure development. We should get these people speaking nature and us nature guys speaking their language, which relates to another question that we didn't have time to address, which which is horizontal integration of sectors. We need to involve planning, economy. We need to talk to the real decision makers who have the decision uh, wielding power. And and the last uh, comment is very specific. I think we have a great um, occasion now uh, to talk different languages through another institution that we're linked to, which is Urbio. And we're discussing a joint uh, session with the International Federation of Landscape Architects. So if we can have a scientific event uh, in preparation for, uh, for uh, the conference of the parties and other events between landscape architects and, and people who think about nature, that would be one great example of something we can do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh. Uh, okay, uh, just to, to finalize then, uh, I think this is a very uh, good discussion uh, you, you had. Uh, the, the, the answer to the main question, how to create a support city and regional policy for effective nature-based solution to urban sustainability, resilient livability, you don't have a definitive answer, sorry to say that, but you advanced very uh, fast in learning more in the last, about this in the last uh, 10, 20 years, I would say. And also a discussion we had here uh, in all our questions is not just a question of one group of people. I think we need a whole change in the profession, how uh, uh, people, engineers, planners, uh, biologists, everyone work in the cities actually do things differently and then it's a kind of puzzle. We need to have all the pieces together. If you miss one piece, maybe you cannot develop something. And at the same time, you need also to, to convince the broader stakeholders. You know, our, if you work in the city, your boss, your mayor, how you make your mayor, and even the people sometimes, the developers that support his campaign, that actually biodiversity is a good uh, uh, thing for, 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 for doing things differently in the way you, you include a, a nature-based solution to, to urban development. And you have some experiences on that as well that I could show. But it, 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 it means it, it's a large uh, uh, change. This is not going to happen uh, over time. And our hope, like the question before, is the young people. I'm sure the next generations uh, we do, you're going to do things better, much better than you do now. 
but the question is whether you be uh, have time to uh, revert or even stop some many of the change you have discussed in the beginning of this uh, presentation. I would like to thank you all for listening and I hope you come to the next uh, webinar. Uh, David, you want to say a little bit more about that? And yes, thank you uh, Jose and Oliver for presenting today. Thanks all for coming. We have one last comment from the floor that is a, is a nice uh, bookend to our, uh, to our webinar. It's from um, Helen Romani from Israel. And she talks about the idea of that they have just recently created the Jerusalem um, Gazelle Valley Urban Nature Park. And what's interesting about uh, that in particular to this conversation is that it it's, uh, has a designation in the municipal budget and it matches available sites to local communities with education, leisure, neighborhood cohesion. It's a, it's a synthetic idea that many cities could, uh, could apply uh, around the world. Thank you again for coming to this. We have the next one is July 2nd. You can go to the website that's on the screen here to see what the what the future webinars will be. They will be very broad uh, in terms of uh, nature-based solutions, community building, participation. The next one, led by Chantal Bonham, is about integrating uh, business the business community and business solutions into nature-based solutions. We would love it if you went to take the survey and let, let us know how to improve our our uh, webinar series. Um, you can see the surveymonkey.com link on the screen. Thank you very much. We will be leave, we will uh, be um, posting complete uh, video of each of these websites on the website below the Urbis Dialogues website, so you can see uh, webinar number one from last month and all of them into the future. This will be posted in about uh, ten days to two weeks. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to Jose. Thanks to Oliver. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.